Today, this evening, we are here to discuss and talk about something that has come up as a new word into our lexicon or our dictionary or our medical surgical terminology called prehabilitation. It was something I had not heard of till about three months ago when I was writing up the book and I found these words happening when I was looking up the dictionary. Uh, just like enhanced recovery from surgery and daycare surgery, we are now moving our focus to improving results with elective surgeries. And in that context, I think Dr. Shivram has lots to share with us. So I will not stay in his way. As usual, you put in your questions in the chat box. We'll try and answer them as it goes along. Uh, Dr. Shivram, to you, please. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. Thank you for all who are all attending here. Prehabilitation before elective surgery, this is one of my favorite topic. Uh, as Dr. Rajan said, uh, many of us were not familiar with this. When we started doing the abdominal wall reconstruction and uh, basically the bariatric surgery, and all, we got into prehabilitation uh, mode of many of these patients and the results were fantastic and a uh, lot of things improved in our uh, uh, care pathway. Let me start with a small uh, case capsule here. See this is uh, like any other case of our day-to-day. 67-year-old -day. Frail gentleman, he had vague abdominal pain and discomfort, went to a physician, then uh, on evaluation, he found to have a carcinoma in the ascending colon, properly evaluated and uh, fitness was given by the physician. Patient was type two diabetic and uh, HbA1c was 8.7. Um, smoker, chronic smoker, and a sedentary lifestyle, uh, hemoglobin nine gram percent. So then he was admitted by the surgeon and underwent a open right hemicolectomy. During the course of surgery, he received a two pints blood transfusion. So everything went on well, surgery was uh, good and the relatives were happy. Um, Post-operatively, this patient uh, started coughing. Then on x-ray, it showed a pneumonic patch. And for that, he was to be treated uh, with continued antibiotics and all the treatment for the pneumonia. Meantime, he developed uh, some wound infection and wound dehiscence. And uh, his discharge was delayed, recovery delayed and required dressing for a long time. Uh, later, few months later, he developed a incisional hernia, which required surgery later. So if you see in this case, um, for an ordinary person, everything appears good, everything went on well, everything documented, and he received the correct treatment. Unfortunately, he developed some post-operative events and uh, however, that was appropriately treated. So the question is, anything better or different could have been done for this patient? So let us look into this. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, nobody no questions there, so we'll go there. So the point is, surgery is like running a marathon, especially the major surgeries, you don't go to marathon without proper preparation. Many of the people who run marathon or do exercises know that this requires at least a month's preparation. And if you <clears throat> run a marathon without proper preparation, it doesn't have any good results and nobody will be satisfied. So if the surgery is like running a marathon. Both, even surgery, requires adequate preparation. There are 
invisible and unmeasurable physiological challenges which occur when we do a marathon or do a major surgery there is massive and massive neuroendocrine and inflammatory response to this surgery which uh, many things may not be measurable and may not be uh, noticeable at all and goes unnoticed uh, if you see the literature the post operative complications after major surgery can go up to 40% and the length of hospital stay and the recovery can be prolonged and increased readmissions and all this cause lot of money so with this things in mind and the assessment of risk of complications in a particular surgery it's not that we are uh, thinking about the stage of the disease or the problems associated with the disease itself the high risk surgical patient has lot of things to assess it may be older person and a frail individual there may be multiple comorbidities and many times we don't uh, take his lifestyle and behavioral factors into consideration before posting him for surgery he may be very physically inactive and poor fitness level smoking and uh, hazardous drinking and there may be some elements of uh, impaired nutrition or malnutrition so the point is we have to take a holistic approach before scheduling uh, these patients for a major event in this context i think we should uh, think more about prehabilitation this is nothing but a rehabilitation process prior to surgery with the aim of making the patient good to undergo this surgery and to have a good outcome and an excellent recovery after the major event on in the life of this patient the name comes from basically two suffixes that is preemptive rehabilitation pre and rehabilitation comes from preemptive rehabilitation so as i said major surgery requires the uh, preparation of various systems and also it is an opportunity to optimize the risk fac factors and improve his functional capacity before he goes for surgery basically we are making a person fit to fight so this making the person fit to fight is in the simple word is the prehabilitation pre operative period if we spend little more time it gives an excellent opportunity and um, it is described as the teachable moment in the life of the patient he may not be receptive when we summary says it during other time but if a person has to undergo a surgery and the surgeon says certain things pre operatively the patient is definitely receptive and his behavioral changes can be perceptible and it can be a life changing event in his uh, life altogether it may be the smoking habit it may be the hazardous drinking which he is used to it or he may be uh, eating unnecessarily and unintentionally and putting on weight and the weight management many things can be changed if we take little more uh, time during the pre operative period so a partnership concept has to be uh, evolved between the patient and the surgeon that these are the things you have got going wrong in your lifestyle and if you change these things and take little time and then come for surgery or we'll post you once you improve a little bit it may have a life long effect on these patients and we may have a good very operative outcome 
more than that what i see is that when we say all these things patients are very receptive and if something goes wrong during the post operative period they can't blame the surgeon totally so they are also responsible for their uh, surgery and also post operative complications if there is any and we are putting the patient in the center of the entire thing and he has to own his responsibility also to some extent so i say many patients that it's a 50% myself and another 50% yourself partnership we will do our job best so you have to do your things best so these things can have definitely lot of changes in these patients so dr rajan lakshman and other others so you have any opinion on this or what's what do you think about it very very the, nice intro sorry, sorry. It, yeah sorry sorry go rajan now the the problem that we have is a very short interval between diagnosis and doing surgery there isn't a significant emphasis given on to pre operative preparation of the patient physical mental and other things it comes as a kind of a shock and then two days later you are operated in respect of the change and things like hemoglobin and other things are corrected by blood transfusions which is the wrong thing to do if you give anybody pre op blood transfusion we have, everybody knows that the infection rate is higher the recurrence rates are worse the recovery is slower because there is some immunological phenomena triggered by the blood transfusions and other things so we need to have a gap between diagnosis and posting for surgery in which prehabilitation can be done now in the nhs and in in america and other places where you go on to a waiting list irrespective of your surgery you go on to a waiting list there's a priority in waiting list that is the time they get to do proper prehabilitation which is why they are advocating it how we are going to do it in india in our circumstances is needs a lot of education of the doctors first surgeons first and then we will be reflected onto the patient that's just my comment please if i may add people are hesitant to mention this but there is a degree of anxiety on the part of the surgeon to take the patient to the operation theater yes uh, sadly so uh, because as you rightly said the patient must be the central figure nothing else should matter but it is easier said than done uh, uh, the the milieu the, the atmosphere here is that if you put them if you make them wait give them some tasks to do like having a limb physio or a chest physio stop smoking and insist on those things for a couple of weeks then they'll go away elsewhere that's the kind of anxiety that people have but nevertheless when we are doing elective surgery we have to mention uh, about prehabilitation and it doesn't matter if they go away somewhere you have to stick to your guns and with time people will not drift true yeah i think yes, all- yes ravi dr ravi shankar uh I, rajan sir while your point about pre operative blood transfusion is well taken i think i i would certainly agree with you that we should avoid giving pre operative blood transfusion the the, the the rules are there the the this one the criteria are there in patients who are uh, no cardiac problems hemoglobin of 8 is acceptable if they have cardiac problems hemoglobin of 10 is desirable but the the your comment about uh, you know immunologic phenomena and things they they have definitely been there in the past but a lot of evidence and lot of studies have shown that this is not true however i think it is still better to not transfuse these patients agreed agreed thank you dr shivram please continue dr gurusham tapa raised his hand Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> yes, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. All of you. Good evening. Uh, evening. Shivram. Uh, yeah, rightly mentioned. Uh, if it is a elective surgery, more so involving GI tract. Even uh, yeah, I, I do practice and I do accept uh, your way of mentioning. 
if you make them realize that they are also part of the role to have the final outcome which all of us are interested if you make them aware before doing the surgery definitely even if the patient is illiterate they will understand better more so nutritional part of it so if we explain them in their own way of how they can uh, uh, get up the nutrition in their own way at their house definitely they will understand better and uh, the outcome will be better like you said 50 50% i go to little more uh, lower extent mentioning that you can do a clap only with two hands not with a single hand i tell them i showed them in fact in front of them <laughs> to get the other hand from their side and so that the clap will be is uh, heard by all of us True. so recently in just 10 days back we had a case where he was uh, the like almost a uh, end fistula like a uh, uh, young girl young girl 24 years gynec surgery for a pelvic mass we had sent her home almost for 9 months with the, all the explanation of nutritional aspects in writing then we operated just 10 days back we could close the fistula nicely and and she went home so definitely you make them more responsible not only the patient and the patient relatives so they will understand better and outcomes will be better i do agree with your opinion thank you <clears throat> thank you sir thank you let us move on a uh, lot of us confuse between optimization and uh, prehabilitation optimization definitely is there and um, it is the best use of the situation or the resource available and most of the time what we aim at optimization is to see that the surgery goes on well the intro op events should go on well and when at the end of it we all feel happy that we have done enough optimization it may be botox injection or a ppp in a massive uh, ventral hernia but in the prehabilitation we are going beyond that we are not only looking at the intro op events we are looking at a good post operative recovery and the getting back the patient to the uh, general work and his normal life and that's what's the importance of the prehabilitation so this is a form of strength training preventing the injuries before the actual occurrence so that is the aim in case of prehabilitation so when we patient comes to us for a major surgery or so it is like battery charging especially the cancer patients so with prehabilitation we charge the battery patient goes to the surgery and some of the uh, battery life is coming down again recharge it with the rehabilitation and with fully charged after proper uh, rehabilitation he will go back to the society as a productive individual so that is the concept we all have to develop in these uh, patients who come for major surgery if you see all the re- research and whatever uh, papers produced prehab and without no prehab there is good evidence that if you have done a good prehabilitation most of the patients don't go into ventilator or even icu we can avoid they can be extubated early they can be discharged early and the quality of life and the functional outcome at the end of it is very good and they go back to the society as the productive people early in the same thing if you don't do a proper prehabilitation they have lot of problems and entire hospital uh, stay may be increased and ultimately the cost which is going to increase and it is not good neither for the patient or for the surgeon next come to the crux of the issue how to do prehabilitation basically there are three or four factors which we have to remember uh, using a good combination of psychological the physical and uh, nutritional and also the behavioral changes which we can uh, adopt or emphasize on the patient to do before surgery 
definitely the ultimate outcome will be good. Many patients, we don't consider much about their uh, functional capacity and uh, we get into trouble. So many patients may require a certain amount of exercise prescription and uh, some structured strength training and medical optimization and the nutritional problems, if they are, there are anything, we may have to evaluate and correct it. And the stress management, every patient is undergoing a major surgery or an uneventful or an eventful event in a life, he will be under some stress. And the lifestyle choices, I said, smoking, alcohol, exercise, sleep hygiene, all these things. So coming to the prehabilitation strategies, there are very well structured uh, pre-operative strength training uh, usually goes in the, in the physical uh, exercise and department of the physiotherapy and rehabilitation. We, they have structured programs. We can ask them to help our patients. Then inspiratory training, a simple uh, spirometer which costs around 150 or 180 rupees, which we can uh, start during our initial days of when the patient comes to hospital in a week or earlier, 10 days earlier. It does a lot to the patient. And the supplementation, whatever is uh, required, whether it is the uh, whey protein or the vitamins which are deficient and the pre-operative education as Dr. Uh, Elgarchan rightly said, and anxiety reducing strategies, all these things will go a long way. I take the help of our nutritionist many times for a evaluation proper and also help us in uh, improving these patients. There may be many times we just check albumin and say that yes, albumin is okay, then we can postpone surgery. There may be so many other things, especially the vitamin B12, vitamin D, which is deficient and the sarcopenia. And there are many scoring systems and the uh, methods to evaluate the nutritional uh, uh, problems, which we have not adopted in our pre-operative pre period. And there is sufficient evidence to say that the nutritional modulation with um, immunonutrition and the high protein diet, even for five days pre-operatively, does a lot of good to the patient and the metabolic and immune response of these patients is much, much better. And this can reduce complications, hospital stay, and the expenditure for these patients. So there are a lot of things in this and there is very good literature. And the anesthesia, this anesthesia recent in the 2019 uh, is very good explanation and how to go about it. The high protein oral nutrition solutions, which can be given vitamin D, all these things, uh, perioperatively, pre-op, and then during hospital stay, and also the post-operative period, they do a lot of things good for these patients, especially our lot of vegetarian patients. Uh, the Many of the deficiency may be there, and also the proteins, Earlier, the surgeons have the habit of giving, prescribing vitamin B complex and vitamins and tonic to the patients, all that has given away. I think at least these, um, if you properly evaluate and supplement what is deficient, that should definitely do good. So already um, you all spoke about preoperative anemia correction. I fully agree that we should not think giving blood is the solution. There are so many other things. Most important is uh, we have to evaluate why the patient's hemoglobin is low and not presume that just what disease he has has caused uh, this one. So once we properly evaluate and if you, that is the iron deficiency anemia, quickly we can improve even the hemoglobin without transfusion, with a uh, iron therapy intravenous and vitamin B12 folate. And if it has to be improved quickly, um, 
many people give erythropoietin, which can improve the hemoglobin in about three to seven days or so. So I think we should think alternatives to blood transfusion unless it is really necessary. And even for the major surgeries, the transfusions is almost no, no these days. I think we should uh, look at how to evaluate anemia. And also if there is not an emergency situation, definitely we can correct the anemia with, uh, with other methods other than blood transfusion. And sarcopenia is another thing which uh, we don't think about it at all in uh, most of our patients, especially the elderly patients. It's a combination of progressive loss of lean body mass with associated functional impairment. So all of us will have this as the age advances unless we are doing good physical exercise. And sarcopenic obesity is another thing which many patients have where the muscle mass reduces, especially the abdominal obesity increases. And this has a lot of problems post-operatively. And if we can take some time before surgery and correct these things, definitely good. As the age advances and the sedentary life, especially even youngsters we see, there is a very sedentary lifestyle which can cause a lot of hormonal changes in the body and the decrease in the motor unit numbers, altered satellite cell number and uh, function, mitochondrial dysfunction and the uh, cell protein metabolism impairment and increased inflammation. All these things definitely will uh, have an effect on the post-operative outcome of these patients. How to assess sarcopenia? A CT image at the level of L3 spinal level. Uh, you can see the paraspinal muscles, how they have gone it into atrophy. And this is the good without sarcopenia. And this is the with sarcopenia. That is a good way of assessing it. Definitely we can improve this patient preoperatively if we take some time. Uh, better to take nutritionist help and the protein intake has to improve 1.5 to 2.5 grams high protein uh, diet in these patients for some time and a supervised structured exercise training. It requires to be supervised because uh, some of these people may hurt themselves and they should come to the physiotherapy department, get their muscles strengthened and with the, that program, then their post-operative uh, outcome will be definitely much, much better. This is another thing which we have to adopt in our surgical protein. So any comments uh, till now, Dr. Rajan, sir? Can't hear you. Sorry, just the importance of the CT scan and all these things, because anyway, you do a CT scan for major, most of the major pathologies. And it is our eyes that have to be looking at the sacral muscle, uh, the paraspinal muscle mass and assess the amount of sacropenia preoperatively. What is already pre-presentation, what has already happened to the patient? Most patients have a period of anorexia, nausea, vomiting, some symptom. They come to us with a loss of nutrition. And it's much more important that we look at these uh, points. We never look at these paravertebral structures and other things. So it is important that the CT scan is assessed in a more global view. Secondly, nutritional supplements must have the nutritionist advice on specific uh, elements that will that the patient is used to. It's no use introducing egg to somebody who doesn't eat eggs. He must get his nutrition from the food he has been getting or used to um, uh, digesting before the disease came. So that is the level at which we should work with the patient. Otherwise, these points are very clear, please. 
Right. Yeah. I think um, Dr. Lakshman and Dr. Ravi Shankar had spoken about mid-on circumference, a good marker, absolutely true that uh, uh, CT as Dr. Uh, Rajan put it, many of these abdominal surgeries are done, we can take these things. Um, Dr. Rajan, you're looking at the chart box. Yes, yes, there is. There's something about uh, protein intake in chronic renal failure patients, how to improve. Yeah. Uh, any answer for that? Dr. Lakshman has answered, saying give protein and dialysis if necessary needed. Uh, do you have any comments, sir? Uh, no, there are, um, ne nephrologists will advise, there are certain uh, proteins which are safe even I think if I remember one is nephro-safe. There are proteins which are safe, can be given even in the CKD patients. And most of these patients anyway on dialysis. So that way also they are protected. So there are ways to come, out, come over this problem. Dr. Gurushantapa has put a very important comment. Blood is a drug <laughs> and should be given only if indicated. It you think of blood as a medication, then all the indications will get more streamlined. Yes, sir. Thank you for that comment. <clears throat> blood is a transplant. Uh, yeah, it's a transplant. Yes, <laughs> it's a form of transplant. Yes. Uh, so we yeah. Take the blood transmission very lightly. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Gurshantapa's comment is very correct. It's a drug and we should consider yeah. Okay, transplant should not take it very lightly. <clears throat> and Dr. Lakshman has answered that branch chain amino acids are preferred in those with renal disease. So that also is something they can keep in mind when planning the diet for these pa renal patient, failure patients. Right. Yeah, continue, sir. Yeah, Ravi, Ravi has a question. He has raised his hand. Oh, sorry. I, yes. Yes, Ravi. You're muted yourself. Uh, blood transfusion. I always tell my students, if you have to transfuse one unit of blood, you don't have to transfuse one unit of blood. If blood has to be transfused, it has to be two units plus. Otherwise, you can do without it because the risk-benefit ratio is very heavily uh, in, the, in favor of risk if you transfuse one unit of blood. So... Always remember, I think, we, if at all, we have to transfuse, transfuse intra or post-operatively, and uh, you have to do it more than one unit of blood. And second thing is albumin, as Dr. Shivaram has very clearly commented, is considered as a nutritional marker, but in the acute phase, it's an acute phase reactant. It's an acute inflammatory marker, but in the long long term, it is an, uh, along with other things like pre-albumin and, you know, and uh, transferrin and things like that is a nutritional marker as well. So uh, albumin has to be only given the credence that, um, you know, based on the situation. And uh, I think the physicians have this habit of transfusing albumin in the post-operative period, I think, which is also very wrong. I think giving uh, pre uh, post-operative albumin transfusion is only benefiting the, the pharma <laughs> pharmaceutical industry rather than the patient. Yeah, right. And, and that Another little side comment is that the emphasis of blood transfusion to raise the hemoglobin to get fitness for anesthesia. Now, that is something which our anesthetic colleagues put into place and said, you get bring the HB up by transfuse and I'll take the case tomorrow. So that is a, a way in which the you know emphasis on blood transfusion went into preoperative periods just to be able to get the anesthetic fitness. Now, that was not the right thing and today it's proven and even the anesthetists themselves have dropped that 10 gram limit for fitness for general anesthesia and they are a little more considerate looking at the whole patient. And also, yes, Dr. whole blood, it is the components, if at all yes. required, whether it is PRBC or the plasma like that and uh, whole blood transfusion is almost out. Given up. Totally. Dr. Gurshan Tapa? Yeah. Uh, uh, whatever all these uh, things which I mentioned, yes, scientifically and where they can be like, there are many specialists available under single umbrella. 
uh, nicely these things can be done but what i teach my post graduates uh, whenever it comes to you personally to build up uh, for a good outcome of the surgical procedure they should know what are the local things available as a nutritional products for that particular family for that particular area and how much it is going to yield if they can understand and if they can tell them the local preparations how much they can eat that will give a lot of information to the local people so that they can come back with a good uh, nutritional outcomes this is what i insist for my post graduates and sincerely they implement and uh, we have seen lot of good results uh, when there are elective gi surgeries or hepatobiliary surgeries uh, which are going up along with what all you have mentioned as a scientific evidence excellent excellent point yeah yes sir let's go on with hads hads yes <laughs> hospital anxiety depression scales yes hospital anxiety depression scale uh, i have put it on the right side these are all available uh, everywhere not very difficult and uh, uh, many of these patients as is said they have anxiety depression low self care many of them hesitate even to discuss much and another factor is the relatives tell us don't discuss with the patient even though patient has so much quest many questions and anxiety relatives won't allow us to uh, inform the patient again and again so these changes ch things are changing gradually i think we have to educate the relatives also and then take the patient and the relatives uh, into consideration and do the proper um, intervention and psychologists are now available therapists they are all very um helpful in these case patients and always better to take the help of these counselors in uh, in in the psychological factors in these patients so after this um um improvement of the nutritional functional and the behavioral changes and the psychological factors let me deal little bit with uh, the some of the pre operative modifiable risk factors which can which many of us we treat but may not be very uh, seriously um i just want to touch upon the morbid obesity smoking diabetes management malnutrition already we discussed and some of the surgical site infection factors how we can modify obesity is uh, one thing which can create havoc in surgeon's life every surgeon uh, for a, a thin patient is a delight for every surgeon and also for anesthetist when the obese patient comes both anesthetist and the surgeon Uh, have problems <clears throat> and it has it can cause significant problems in the form of wound complications dvts chest complications post op recovery everything but we fail even to check the body mass index of the patients many times we don't consider uh, importance of checking the weight and if the bmi is more than 30 or 35 definitely these patients require first the weight management in the form of dietitian referral or exercise and pre frequent counseling and if there is time definitely better to reduce the, nowadays i refuse many of these patients who have 35 to 40 bmi 45 bmi tell them first strictly on reduce weight and then come for surgery and then continue losing weight post operatively sometimes they may require even bariatric surgery first otherwise so many of these big patients who have massive hernias uh, if they are not able to lose weight we do bariatric surgery acceptable bmi after the weight loss and then the repair so this is one such patient one doctor's uh, mother who had multiple comorbidities and uh, 
BMI 46, so 26 kg massive hernia. Uh, so we did sleeve gastrectomy initially and waited for one year and then improved her all other uh, parameters and then took up her surgery and everything went on well. And that's one happy family which uh, tell so many other people that how to manage these patients. Many of us get into this vicious hernia cycle. The obese patient operate, repair the hernia, then there is a mesh infection, then readmission, then remove the mesh, and then again reoperate hernia. So this cycle we see many often going on without realizing that it's all because of the morbid obesity patient have, where whatever you the size of the mesh you put may not hold if the patient continues to put on weight. Smoking is another uh, problem. I um, don't want to talk much about it. All of you know uh, very well that at least 30 days prior to surgery, if you stop smoking, um, it has a lot of effect in the post-operative period and the patient can do much better. Diabetes mellitus, so physicians may give fitness, but it's best to have an acceptable HbA1c of at least less than seven, ideally 6.5 or so, and uh, good glycemic control gives a lot of uh, good results post-operatively, especially the surgical side occurrences in these patients. Carbohydrate loading. This is, uh, till recently also I was not practicing. Um, so then I realized how criminal it is to keep the patients fasting many times more than 12 hours or so. And uh, without, it's only for our convenience, we were doing that. There is a lot of good evidence to say that if you do a carbohydrate loading of these patients two or three hours prior to surgery, there is reduced perioperative hyperglycemia, improves insulin resistance, maintains muscle strength, decreases patient anxiety because patient has something to drink or take on the early morning of the operation day. And also it reduces a lot of lot of length of hospital stay. There's a lot of good literature on this. And uh, when we use, started using is pre-carb, which costs just 200 rupees. We give them at uh, six o'clock in the morning, whether the patient is at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. So patient had something in the morning, so they're very comfortable. And um, this is one thing I think we all can uh, start practicing Many of the anesthetists are very worried that patient uh, takes, if you say something clear liquid, patient may take some coffee or something semi-solids and then they have problems. I think the confidence building measure, though, that way this pre-corp is um, very good so that it's clear. Anesthetists also happy to give that. So this is one thing we can adopt in our day-to-day uh, -day surgery practice. There are a lot of things I think we have already spoken about this surgical um, site infection factors like um, chlorhexidine bath on the previous day evening and on the day of the surgery and prophylactic antibiotics at the time of induction or 30 minutes prior to surgery, prior to skin incision, prophylactic post-operative antibiotics, there is no need at all single dose is enough. Hair shaving is no, and if at all hair clipping has to be done, it can be done in the operation theater of the patient has given general anesthesia. That's what we practice. There is no need of bowel preparation, most of the cases. And many of the patients without our knowledge may be taking homeo medicines, Ayurvedic, Yunani, and this is one history we should take and it should be stopped three to four weeks prior to surgery because many of the things we don't know what they contain and many times it may prolong the uh, bleeding or clotting time and cause havoc in the post-operative 
period. Um, this is my analogy of holding an umbrella before rain and after the rain starts. How many number of and umbrellas you give, a person is already wet. Similarly, if you have to give antibiotic, it has to be given uh, before skin incision, pesties at the time of the induction. And after that, whatever and how many doses you give post surgery that won't give any prophylaxis for infection. Um, I saw some of the patient reactions in the net. So they're all quite happy if you explain to them about the prehabilitation process and <coughs> they love it once the liking is done, they understand the things and their reactions are quite good. So let us come back at the end, maybe another one or two slides to this case scenario of our what we started earlier. Probably this patient, if we had uh, spent good prehabilitation by di good diabetic control and also improving his uh, hemoglobin and stopping the smoking and improving his the muscle strength and the respiratory reserve by incentive spirometer. All these things took some time, a week or two, before taking him for surgery. Probably he would have been done better and his post-operative uh, stay would have been much more uneventful. So friends, Spend more time pre-operatively with the patient. Definitely, I will assure you that you will spend less time with him post-operatively. So let us not be in a hurry to schedule the case for the next day morning or the next available OT slot. Let us spend some time understanding and preparing the patient, counseling, educating, and uh, to have a better post-operative outcome. So let us make the patient part of the overall care plan. Let us not keep him away from our decision-making. Whenever patients are involved and he is in the center of our all of our effort, then we will have definitely have better and good results. Um, so the most important emphasis is to make the patient fit for the marathon, which is the major surgery. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. So Thank Dr. you, Dr. Shivram. That was nice, educative. We have learned many points by listening to this. My only concern is in our setup of private practice, if somebody goes on to a prehabilitation regime for a week or 10 days or three weeks, Unfortunately, my colleague from the other corporate hospital will take the case and we lose. So that kind of negativity that runs between ourselves is the first thing that needs to be sorted out. Respect the fact that you are so-and-so's patient and help the patient and that doctor to do well, do a good job. Because sooner or later, you will be on the same side and people will leave you and go somewhere. So... It is important that we also work together to improve the life of patients. There's one little query from Dr. Ravi Shankar, who said that uh, he wants a pre-op strategy for significant loss of domain in incisional hernias. That is slightly outside the purview of this in that that is more part of optimization for intra-op problems. Uh, Dr. Shivram is talking about um, the prehabilitation, which is a little more broader thing. However, I request Dr. Shivram to just say a few words of how you would improve the abdomen for receiving contents after there is significant loss of domain. Dr. Shivram, any few words? Sure, sure. Uh, first important thing is the proper assessment uh, that is usually done by a good CT scan and uh, volume, how much volume is outside the abdomen and how much volume is inside the abdomen. 
Broadly, if it is more than 30% of the viscera is outside the abdominal cavity, then these people most often require optimization. We require a, make a good um, chest preparation. And most importantly, to put the back, the contents into the abdomen, two things we do. One is preoperative pneumoperitoneum. I have practiced this one or two patients. It takes about two weeks every day to uh, fill air into the peritoneal cavity. What I do is put a guided catheter into the peritoneal cavity by the um, interventional radiologist, by the ultrasound guidance or sometimes CT guidance and keep it. And this is used every day. The patient comes to the hospital and air is injected into the peritoneal cavity till he feels a little bit of discomfort. And again, he will come next day or the next day. So like this, if you do for about 10 to 12 days, and again, if you do a CT scan, it shows that most of the contents can go back into the peritoneal cavity. That's the time he's ready for surgery. The other way of doing it is the uh, Botox injection on either side of the uh, mid axillary line, right side or anterior axillary line, we inject the Botox. There is a calculation for the preparation, everything. This temporarily paralyzes the oblique muscles so that the abdominal wall gets relaxed. So this effect gives good, uh, and after this Botox injection, wait for about a week or 10 days and then do surgery. In massive cases, we can use both, both PPP and also the Botox injection to improve the, and increase the space inside the abdominal wall cavity and then do the surgery. So both these methods are practiced. Right. Thank you, Dr. Shivram. That was nice. Uh, Dr. Rohit Kumar has asked uh, any comments for training programs for improving muscle mass, aerobic or weight training kind of things in the rehabilitation. Is there any specified programs, any specified Definitely. schedules? Definitely it is there. If you see the net also, you'll get it. But if you tell your physiotherapy department and ask the patient to come to the physiotherapy department preoperatively for a week or 10 days, they will definitely help them. See, basically improve the muscle strengthening exercises and also the cardiorespiratory uh, strengthening exercises. Mm -hmm. You can ask your physiotherapy department and uh, that itself is good. They will do a good job. Mm. And uh, it is also important that you use you do not do too much of isometric exercises where you increase muscle mass, but rather you do the repetitive exercise so that you increase the muscle tone and the strength of the muscle. So there is a little need for professional help in guiding to form these programs for the, or educate the patients for this and the physiotherapists are the best for it. Yes. All right. Um, Anybody, any open house, anybody wants to add some comments? Uh, good topic, sir, to start the year. Congratulations. Nice talk. Dr. Shivram, I think we are greatly indebted to you for preparing and bringing it to us in such a nice way. This is the first of the major talks of the year, and I think we shall look forward to more from the August faculty that have attended and also the students to participate in a wider range. I only wish more people had tuned in because this was highly educative, especially for the postgraduates, but we seem to have had about 20, 22 people only. Nonetheless, more smaller the audience, but more attentive the audience. So it's better to have a small and good audience. Thank you. With that comment, I'll say thank you. And uh, Dr. Shivram, thank you very much once more. Thank you. Thank you for all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Lakshman. I'm going to shut off. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.